welcome to all of you this evening. It is good to see you. If you're joining us online tonight, wherever you're watching us from, we welcome you as a part of this service. Amen. Praise God. I want to um, wrap up this evening. This is part four of Love Not the World. And so just kind of as a starting point here, I want to uh, reread our primary text that we have been unwrapping the last several weeks. <laughs> and I want to read it unpacking. Yeah, sorry, I think unpacking is, is I'm trying to be cool and I just can't do it. I want, to, I want to read to you from the uh, Amplified this evening. I think I pretty much have just been reading the King James to start with, but I want to read the Amplified. And um, look at that. I didn't need Jalen tonight. How about that? Wow. <laughs> uh, I finally did it right. So the Amplified says it this way, verse 15, 1 John 2, 15. Do not love or cherish the world or the things that are in the world. If anyone, if anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in him. For all, somebody say all. All, not some, not a portion, all that is in the world. The lust of the flesh, craving for sensual gratification. The lust of the eyes, greedy longings of the mind and the pride of life. Assurance in one's own resources or in the stability of earthly things. These do not come from the Father, but are from the world itself. And the world passes away and disappears. And with it, the forbidden cravings, the passionate desires, the lust of it. But he who does the will of God and carries out his purposes in his life, abides or remains forever. Lord Jesus, thank you for another opportunity to join together. Thank you for another opportunity to open our hearts, our minds, our spirits to your word. I pray, God, that you would speak to us this evening, that, that you would work on us this evening, that we would have hearts that are open to receive let our hearts be good ground for the seed of your word tonight, that we may be benefited by it, that it may accomplish in us and through us what you desire. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. You may be seated. We have talked so far about the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes, and so this evening as we wrap up, we are going to focus on the pride of life. I touched on it um, two weeks ago, last week was Leadership Summit, but I, I believe that, that these three things are a, a progression, um, and I'm not going to rehash too much, reteach. You can go back if you missed any of it or need to be refreshed. But that, that the, the lust of the flesh uh, is, is sort of one level, if you will. And then the lust of the eyes is going deeper. And then, as we will talk about here this evening, the pride of life. I think it's interesting that I, I, I feel like, and, and um, I've said this pretty much every week in this series, the last thing I ever want to do is just to try to make something out of nothing. Or, I, again, I feel like sometimes I've heard people teach or preach, and it was deep and powerful and awesome, and I walked away with no clue of what it was really all about. <laughs> and and uh, I, that, that's my desire is to be practical, real. That's been my desire in ministry for as long as I can remember. Um, and so I, 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 I trust that throughout this series and anything else I teach or preach, uh, there's not a sort of, uh, you, you can start, when you start seeing things one way, you can start seeing everything that way. 
uh, and, and I don't want to do that. So hopefully that's my apology for the evening, and uh, here we go. But, but I feel like even you can even see a relation to these verses in the parable of the types of ground that Jesus talked about. I'm not going to read the whole parable, but I am going to read, I want to read to you Mark 4, 15, and this is, this is basically the explanation. He's already talked about the types of ground that the seed is sown on, and here is the explanation. So the first type, he says, These are they by the wayside where the word is sown, but when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away that was sown in their hearts. So it's this surface thing. It never takes root. Again, I, I touched on this a couple of weeks ago. I believe there, there is a difference between um, a, 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 an, a young couple that's engaged, hopefully at least engaged, but a young couple that's engaged that perhaps gives in to a moment of weakness versus someone who is uh, involved in, in perversion. One is a lust of the flesh, the other is going deeper. And, and so this, this, the seed is sown on the wayside, its surface doesn't do anything. But then he says, these are they likewise which are sown on stony ground, who when they have heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness and have, not, and have no root in themselves and so endure but for a time Afterward, when affliction or persecution arises for the world's sake, immediately they are offended. So, so now in the second type of ground, there's actually a little bit of something that happens. It's not just seed sown, the enemy comes along and steals it. There is something that happens in this second type of ground, but it doesn't last. It, it doesn't have the root system to, to be able to, to become everything that it is supposed to be. And then the third, not, not the third and final, but the third kind of ground, and these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lust of other things entering in, choke the, world, choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. And then the final ground, these are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word and receive it and bring forth some thirtyfold, some sixty, and some a hundred. I, I want you to notice that in, this, in the progression of, this, of these four types of ground, there's actually a little bit more that happens with the seed in each kind of ground. The first kind of ground, nothing happens. The enemy just comes along and steals it. The second type, the second type, it takes some root, but it's stony ground, and so it can't really get the root system that it needs. But then the third type, the seed actually goes a little bit farther. It produces a little bit more, but then eventually it is choked out. And I think that is, that is very uh, much in, in line with what the enemy does in our lives, is that as the Word takes root more and more, and as the Spirit of God works more and more in us, He's going to start throwing more things at us. It's not going to be, oh man, well, the seed took root, I guess I'm done. No. He's going to keep going. He's going to keep trying to do whatever He can, no matter how deep the seed goes, to destroy the seed. And, and so this, this, this third part of 2 John, that the, the pride of life, is, is, it, it, it is a, uh, I think it's a very dangerous place to get to. I, I, don't, I don't presume, try not to presume to be smarter than the smart people, but I, I want to I just share this. According to Adam Clark, he says with regards to this pride of life, Adam Clark's commentary says that, it's, that the pride of life is hunting after honors, titles, and pedigrees, boasting of ancestry, family connections, great offices, honorable acquaintance, and the like. And so I, I don't, I don't want to come across as being um, smarter than Adam Clark the Bible scholar, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you, and by the help of the Lord, before we're done here tonight, you'll, you'll see what I mean by this. The pride of life is so much deeper than just hunting after honors and titles and pedigrees. It is 
it, it, it's way more than that. The pride of life. I want, I want you to see this word pride and what it means. And, and, and according to uh, Thayer's Greek lexicon, there, there's the, the word pride in, a, in secular writings uh, from Aristophanes down generally, it means generally empty. Braggart talk, sometimes also empty display in act swagger. Secondly, it is an insolent and empty assurance which trusts in its own power and resources and shamefully despises and violates divine laws and human rights. It is an impious and empty presumption which, which trusts in the stability of earthly things. Let me see if I can try to up my coolness here tonight. I, I, want you to, I, want you to, I want you to notice that. I want you to focus on that definition. An insolent and empty assurance which trusts in its own power and resources and shamefully despises and violates divine laws. The pride of life is not just about What's your job title? How much money do you make? Who's your family? You know, one of the things that's really kind of neat, I, I think, and, and, and I don't know how intentional it was, but it's been a part of us as a church, and, and I, don't, I don't know how intentionally Bishop tried to do this. I do think there was some intentionality to it, but... A lot of you are, you're not really all that knowledgeable of, of UPC stuff. And, and, and that's not a bad thing, and it's not necessarily a good thing either. There could be some good at times. And so some of you, there are, there are some names, if I called them here this evening, you'd be like, who in the world is that? Some of you would have an idea, but, but you know, in, in, in this organization, there's a couple of families that are very well-known families. They're, one of them would be the Mangan family in Louisiana. They pastor one of, if not the largest church in the UPC. And, 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 you know, and so there's something that goes along with name. And, but this is the pride of life is way deeper and, I will say, way more dangerous than just simply being all caught up in your, your pedigree, your accomplishments. And, and here's where I believe we first find the significance and the danger of the pride of life. Isaiah 14 and verse number 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, watch this, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne, where? Above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the heavens. See if I can be cool one more time. I will be like the most high. That was his downfall. He was not content with the role that he had and I mean, if you want to talk about importance and significance, he's one of the three archangels. You can't get much more important than that. You can't get much more significant than that. But he was not content with that, and he wanted to exalt himself above God. He wanted to be like the Most High. So watch this. We've read these verses several times throughout the last... Several weeks of this series, and we will read them one more time here this evening. Genesis 3 and verse 4, And the serpent said unto the woman, You won't surely die. For God doth know 
that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. I think the tone here, I just, you would think after, I haven't seen my wife come in yet, so hopefully she's, she's here, she, but y'all don't go tell her. I'll tell her she can't listen to tonight. Watch it. You think after almost 30 years of marriage, you know, text message communication would always be okay. I've told you all about my sure text with picking up milk, and I had one today that the, the sarcasm got lost, it got missed. It was not a pretty sight. I, and I, I, I tried to say as much. I, I basically said, once again, there's the problem with texting. I was trying to be sarcastic. So I don't want to presume the tone here, but, but I really feel like the tone of what Satan was saying to Eve was that, that it was, this was a negative God knows. He, God's trying to hide something from you. God just does, there's just something God, you know, and, and, and it hit me. I, I, I think I have a basic understanding of this verse, but I've always kind of struggled with it a little bit. And, and the thing that kind of hit me today was, this is kind of like a good parent. There's some things you don't want your kids to ever know. Because when they know them, they now have to deal with the effects of knowing them. A lack of knowledge is not because you're trying to deprive them of something. It's because you've got some perspective on the potential pain that goes along with the knowledge. And so the enemy's trying to twist what God had said and what God was doing. God wasn't trying to deprive Adam and Eve of pleasure and enjoyment and fun. God understood there's some things you don't know and it's a wonderful thing you don't know them. The enemy comes along and it's a trick he still tries to play on us, especially to those of you growing up in the church. What are you missing? How come? You, why, why are they trying to keep you from... What is it you're missing out on? They, I'll tell you what, you're, is there some pleasure? Absolutely, because there is pleasure in sin for the season. The problem is the pleasure in sin is only for a season because everything that's of the world passes away. And when the season is over, you got to pay up. God knows the day you eat thereof, your eyes will be open and you will be as God's knowing good and evil. And the woman saw that the tree was good for food, lust of the flesh, and it was pleasant to the eye. Lust of the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise. Pride of life. Pride of life is about becoming equal with God. Now watch this. The, the King James, and, and we know we consider the King James to be basically the most reliable of translation, but I, there's something I discovered that's interesting that in the King James, again, verse 5, he says, God knows that in the day you eat thereof, your eyes will be open, and you will be as gods. Little g, plural. But watch what most of the other translations say. The Amplified. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like, not like a god, you will be like the god. The New Living Translation, God knows that your eyes will be open as soon as you eat it and you will be like God. The complete Jewish Bible, because God knows that on the day you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God. Not just as little g gods, but you will be like God. And so the pride of life, is about us reaching this point 
where we basically are putting ourselves on a level equal with God. Meaning, we want the right to decide what is good or evil. Rather than leaving that up to God, we want the right to give our opinion. When's the last time God asked you for your opinion? When, when's the last time God sat down with you and said, you know, about these laws I wrote, what, what do you think? Do you think we ought to have some amendments? Should we pass some new laws? No, but the problem is, as we go deeper in this thing, as we press beyond the lust of the flesh, and then we press beyond the lust of the eyes, what we are doing is wearing away our conscience. And the more we wear away our conscience, the more we are elevating ourselves to be like God to decide what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. If you're, going to, if you're sitting here and you're perhaps thinking, what in the world are you talking to us about this tonight? Don't you remember you said we're all the core people? Yes, because I'll tell you the people that are at the most risk of getting caught up in the pride of life, it's not the sinner out on the bar stool. It's not the person in the crack house tonight. The person that has the most danger of getting caught up in the pride of life is you and I who have become so spiritual. We've become so dedicated and committed that we now have reached a level of maturity that we feel it's okay for us to... Look at this. Look at this. Some of you young people need to be listening to paying attention to this. Judges 14, verse 1. Samson went down to Timnath and saw a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. And he came up and told his father and his mother and said, I have seen a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. Now therefore get her for me to wife. Then his father and his mother said unto him, is there never a woman among the daughters of thy brethren or among all thy people that thou goest to take a wife of the uncircumcised, uncircumcised Philistines? Samson, is there not someone that believes like you believe? Is there not someone that trusts in the same God you trust in that you've got to go down to the Philistines to find yourself a wife? And Samson said unto his father, Get her for me, because she pleases me well. I don't care what you're saying. I have decided that I can determine what is best. I have decided that I have... I, I, I have the wisdom and knowledge that I need. No, at least according to what the Scripture says right here, that, that his, Samson's parents did not sit there and tell him why they thought all the reasons were that he should not take a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines. But I guarantee you they basically were saying that because they knew where it would go. And where did it? Go. And of course, here's the other scary thing that we see happen in our lives if we're not careful is in the story of Samson. He didn't give away the farm, he didn't give away his whole secret immediately. I, I, it, it boggles my mind. I, I, wasn't it three times, three times? Wasn't there three separate occasions, the third time being when he told her? I mean, after the first time, when you tell her your secret and she betrays you, you would think, you really would have think you would have learned the first time. But, you know, okay, I mean, it's hard-headed, so the second time. But surely after the second time, something would have awakened in him and, and said, yeah, maybe this is what my parents were warning me against. And yet, 
I mean, how in the world do you think I've lied to her twice and she's put it to the test? If I really tell her the truth, she's just going to ignore it? Because that, that's the pride of life. I can get away with it. I know others need the boundaries. I know others need the, you know, the restraint. But I can get away with it. Oh, hallelujah. This was, this was in essence a part of the children of Israel's problem. Judges 6, 17 and 6. In those days there was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right. And as a, these are the people that God gave the law to. These are the people that God visited. The last, the very last verse of the book of Judges, the very last verse, is basically a repeat of the verse I just read to you. In those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Let me tell you something. There is only one place doing what is right in your own eyes leads to. I, I, boy, I, I don't... I, I don't... I, I, I'm feeling a little bit of that tightness from Sunday, but I don't know if it's the same source. <laughs> Oh, come on, Pastor, you're talking to us on Thursday night about the danger of... Yeah, because it's kind of hard to decide to do what's right in your own eyes when you don't really know what's right. I, I sort of skimmed this today in my study, and, and so I want to be very careful in what I say to not speak in absolutes on something I've only scratched the surface on. But, but you know, the word sin, I think the word sin is really more applicable to us as believers. Transgression, I think, from what I just touched on today, I think transgression may be a word that's a little more applicable to the, to the world because the word sin, as most of you know, the word sin is to miss the mark. It means there's something you're aiming for, there's something you know you should be aiming for, and you don't hit the target. The sinner out there is not shooting for any targets. <laughs> and, and when you and I decide to begin to justify knowing what Scripture says, having an idea of what the Word of God says, but we now begin to decide. Hey, you know, I just don't... I don't know if I see it that way. I don't really know that it's that important. We're, we're now elevating ourselves. Making ourselves. That I, I believe when Satan went to Eve... I, I, I believe he went to her with the understanding, I know what got me in trouble. Was trying to be like God. So if I can somehow get you to the point of being tempted, of trying to be like God, I know how that ends. We, again, back to the, you know, sort of the lack of, maybe knowledge of some UPC stuff. Hopefully some of you are actually more naive to some of this other stuff I'm about to reference than the UPC stuff. But I, there, there, there's, there is this dangerous trend in Christianity where, where not, 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 the, not the saints, but where the pastors are picking and choosing. The word of the Lord in Ezekiel talks about the priests, not, not, the, not the saints, not the, not the church members, the priests. 
have, have done this grave thing because they have put no difference between the clean and the unclean, the holy and the profane. And, and, and I've said it before and I'll say it again tonight. There are things that, that are now acceptable in the church, in the church, that 30, 40 years ago, the world had a problem with. Not Christians, the world. But, but now we have this thing that's crept in to the, to the church, and I say the word church very loosely in this context. But it's crept into the church where, where we, we, we've decided to, you know, we, we're, we're not on the same level with the world, but we're, we're, we're trending, we're tracking with them. And so you watch these changes where, where the decision is made. You know, we, we don't really need to preach about that anymore. We can just ignore that part of Scripture. Oh, we can, we can elevate ourselves. To be God, to be like God. Listen to what the, the wise man Solomon says. Proverbs 12, 15. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes. 16 and 2. All the ways of a man are clean in his own eyes. 21, 2. Every man, every way of a man is right in his own eyes. And then this last one, I believe, describes the world we're in today. There is a generation. There is a generation. Those first three verses were dealing with individuals, a fool, a man. But now, he says, there is a generation. There is this whole group that are pure in their own eyes and yet is not washed from the filthiness. They, they, a generation... A generation that now views themselves as being pure in their own eyes. It's not what I think in my own eyes that matters. It's not my evaluation of myself. It's what does God think? What does God say? What does God's Word say? That, that's the pride of life. It's my opinion. Whatever my opinion is, that's what's matter. That what that's what matters. That's what I'll live by. I'm, I'm now going to elevate myself to this level of being able to to disagree. And, and hear me, folks. I'm not talking tonight about. The, 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 the struggles that we all have, the weaknesses and the, the ups and downs. I mean, the Scripture says a righteous man falls seven times. I'm not talking tonight about perfection. I'm talking about reaching a point where we become conscious of our decisions. And it's, it's no longer just a, 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 a struggle of our flesh, the lust of the flesh. And see, here, here, here's the deal, and again, why, and here's why, to me, the pride of life is not just about titles and pedigree and whatever that Mr. Clark said, because in essence, the pride of life is idolatry. And of course, we know that we have no idol worshipers here tonight. We are all exempt from that because we have no statues here. You have no statues in your home. You have no graven images that you worship. And so, I don't know who you're talking to, Pastor, but you're not talking to me because I'm not an idolater. Well, let's see what a few people have to say. Idolatry meant the worship of idols or the worship of false gods by means of idols, but 
came to mean among the Old Testament Hebrews any worship of false gods, whether images or otherwise, and finally the worship of Yahweh through visible symbols. Ultimately in the New Testament, ultimately in the New Testament, idolatry came to mean not only the giving to any creature or human creation the honor or devotion which belonged to God alone, but giving to any human desire a precedence over God's will. Did you, did you, did you catch that last part? Giving to any human desire. Idolatry is giving to any human desire precedence over the will of God. Oh, hallelujah. <laughs> the good thing about it being 8-12 is I'm this far in, I might as well finish it. I think I need a little water, though. Giving to any human desire when there is conflict between what you want and what the Word of God says, who wins? If your desire wins, you become an idolater. Nelson's Illustrated Bible Dictionary says this, In the New Testament period, the term idolatry began, idolatry began to be used as an intellectual concept. Idolatry became not the actual bowing down before a statue but the replacement of God in the mind of the worshiper. Colossians 3 and 5 points in this direction, put to death covetousness, which is idolatry. At this point, the modern believer must understand the vicious nature of idolatry. While we may not, bow, while we may not make or bow down to a statue, we must be constantly on guard that we let nothing come between us and God. As soon as anything does, that thing is an idol. Oh, y'all still here? Whew. I wanted to tell Sister Tyler, I think this past Sunday was a very momentous day. I am pretty sure I thought about this Sunday night. I don't think Sunday morning or night I apologize one time in any message. So I'm making up for that a little bit here. I'm not apologizing, but um, <laughs> I'm, I, want, I want you to hear that last part again. While we may not make or bow down to a statue, we must constantly... We must be constantly on guard that we let nothing come between us and God. As soon as anything does, that thing is an idol. And do you know the thing that we, I think, as believers, as disciples, struggle with the most coming between us and God? Is us. You coming between you God, me coming between me and God. Because when I put my preferences, my desires, my will above God's will, I have now come between me and God. I am now an idolater. Hmm. That's exactly what Lucifer was doing. It was idolatry. He wanted to be like the Most High. Again, he knew the consequences of that. So the goal is, I want to get Eve and every other human being after her to try to be like God. Because if they will try to be like God, it's going to disrupt their fellowship with God. And so watch, watch to me what is a demonstration of sort of the ultimate danger of the pride of life. Romans 1, 18. 
For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. They hold the... the he's talking about people that know the truth. He's talking about people that have an understanding of the truth, but they hold it in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. God has put all kinds of examples in nature to help us to understand Him, to help us to understand His Word. I mean, just take the simple example in my opinion opinion of one of the biggest topics and issues in Christianity and that of the Godhead. Not one person here tonight believes that you are three separate beings because you are body, soul, and spirit. You understand that's three parts that make up you. So therefore, in nature, we have a visible representation of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Not three separate co-equal persons. It, it, it's been made known from the beginning, Paul says, because, because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the un corruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own flesh to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. The ultimate danger of the pride of life is you reach the point where you, you convince God this is what I want to do. This is how I want to live. No regard for your word. And so God says, if that's the way you want it, I'm turning off all conviction, all condemnation. I'm going to set you free. You want to be like me? There you go. Have at it. and who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Are we not in a day and time in which we serve the creature more than the Creator? It's about what makes man happy, what makes our fellow man happy, not about what the Word of God says. And isn't it amazing this mindset in our world about making each other happy has caused more chaos and confusion than anything the Word of God ever has. For this cause, God gave them up, gave them up unto the vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. You, don't, you want to keep Keep struggling with me and ultimately you don't really want to struggle with me so here you go one of the saddest things in the world to me as a pastor is when somebody reaches a point that they now believe things are okay that at one point they believed were wrong and somehow feel great about the fact they've been set free some of you got friends that used to be here that have now been set free. Some who are still Christians are still involved in church, but they've been set free. How does that happen? It happens because God finally says, if that's the way you want it, have at it. I'm not going to keep bothering you. I'm not going to keep fighting with you. 
I'm not going to keep trying to get your attention and convict you. You want to be like me and run everything and be in charge? Have at it. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetous, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, dis despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Not only do, but we celebrate, we award, we, we put up on pedestals. Message Bible says, I'm not going to read all those verses, I don't think, but most of them. <laughs> Verse 18, but God's angry displeasure erupts as acts of human mistrust and wrongdoing and lying accumulate as people try to put a shroud over truth. But the basic reality of God is plain enough. Open your eyes and there it is. By taking a long and thoughtful look at what God has created, people have always been able to see what their eyes as such can't see. Eternal power, for instance, and the mystery of, this divi of His divine being, so nobody has a good excuse. What happened was this. People knew God perfectly well, but when they didn't treat Him like God, refusing to worship Him, they trivialized themselves into silliness and confusion so that there was neither sense nor direction left in their lives. They pretended to know it all but were illiterate regarding life. <laughs> they pretended to know it all but were, illit were illiterate regarding life. They traded the glory of God who holds the whole world in His hands for cheap figurines you can buy at any roadside stand. Folks, from, from, uh, from one perspective, I, 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 I don't agree with what I'm about to say, but I, I think it's the truth. There's, there's really no reason why I should look at the condition of this world and be surprised. There's really no reason why I should look at everything that's going on, the ungodliness, the immorality, and all. I shouldn't look at any of it and be surprised. Paul clearly told us in Romans 1 what happens when you push God out. What has been happening in this country for decades now? I don't, I don't know if I want to say it started with, but I think one of the big things that's a part of it is when, is when prayer in public schools... You want to push God out? Thankfully, thankfully, He's going to fight with you for a little while. Thankfully, He's going to push back for a little while. You, you, you can't get rid of Him easily, thankfully. But what Paul's saying here is you can get to a point. And now... I mean, think about it. it. It, I mean, 50 years old, when I sit and think about 1971 to now where we are, I have seen in all kinds of ways, technologically, transportation, uh, 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 on and on, I have seen so many different changes in my lifetime. But then I think sometimes about, about my grandmother in her 90s, The, the difference in, in all aspects, the difference of the world that she is in today. I mean, I think it's crazy to go from them big old gray phones to the phones we have now. You know, those original cell phones that you had carried around a big old bag for. I, I remember the first cell phone ever in our family was one of those black phones with the Winding cord in the car. And it was, it was so expensive that there was a code on the phone that my, only my, my mom probably knew it, but nobody else knew it. 
I mean, I guess that was probably late 80s. I got my first car when I turned 16. And back then, they were selling plastic versions of those phones. I had such a problem, apparently, with vanity when I was 16. I bought one. <laughs> stuck it on the dash in my car so that I would look. You know what, though? To be honest, my phone, fake one, got used as much as the real one in my dad's car. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I know what it is to carry, actually, to find... Anybody ever had one of those gray flip phones? Kind of a, I don't know, you know. Man, I had one of those, never used it too much. Somebody said pager a few moments ago. How many of you kids know what a pager was? What would it call you? Pager. Vibrates, tells you the number you got to call. You got to go find a landline to call. Then you hit, you know, you create codes, 911, and then that meant you, I need you right now. I carried out, when I went to University of Maryland, I was also about the same time I became principal of ACS. So I had the cell phone, but I also had a pager. So if you needed me, you had to page me. If you don't just call, you... And now, how many of you still use a landline regularly? Look at that. How many of you don't even have a landline anymore in your house? Look, look at that. I'm, me as well. I still plug it in for people I don't want calling me, but I, I think about how far we, and, but that's, you know, that's, and, and so, I, and I mean, my grandmother, she wasn't even phones. But then you, you get into the morality of, 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 I mean, when she, was a, when she was a kid and a teenager, most of the things, I, 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 I gotta, I, I'm, 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 most of the things that we now, the world labels us because we still believe they're wrong, that was what the world believed. Adultery, homosexuality, fornication, Etc. The world, the, the average American, not the church going Bible thumper. It, it, is so, it is so concerning to me that we have allowed ourselves to, to get caught up in these accusations that we are just religious tradition. It's amazing some of the things that are accused of being religious tradition that again, at one point, society... Accepted. You know, and, and this is my last night for this series, so I, I'm gonna have to. I gotta get it finished. I'm, <laughs> I'm, also, not, I'm also not gonna edit either. I'll just give you one very. This is a very trivial example. This isn't none of the real stuff. Again, another thing. I don't know how, when, whatever. But somehow Bishop set a precedence for as long as I can remember that come to church however you want to come to church. You want to dress up, dress up. You want to come casual, come casual. But you know what's amazing to me? Everybody's now making it all out about if you wear a suit and tie, you're just you're, you're caught up in religious tradition. How is that religious tradition when you can go back to old photos of baseball games and every person in the stands, every man in the stands was in suit and tie? Go back to the original days when golf was first started and people played golf, golf in suit and tie. But if I want to still come to church in suit and tie, I don't care how honest, I don't care how you come unless you're in leadership then there's a little bit of... I don't care. You, 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 you want to you go all out, suit and tie, you ladies want to go all out, dress up, fix your hair. If you don't, so be it. As long as you're modest, do, it's okay. 
But it's just amazing to me the number of things. And again, that one's so trivial. That, that is not even... I don't think you have to wear a tie to go to heaven. I don't think you have to wear a, but be a preacher. But isn't it amazing congressmen and senators and all? They all still dress up to do their job. Of course, I guess running the American government is more important than God's business. But I know I'm just a re- traditionalist because <laughs> my, my, my point is this. Come in T-shirts and blue jeans Sunday. I honestly don't ca- I really don't care. But my point is just this. We don't even realize there's like this string attached to the church from the world. But no, we're not, we're not at the same level they are with all of giving up all of morals and values and all that. We're, but, but we're also, we should be going the opposite direction. The bottom line is this, as to the flesh, uncomfortable as this may be, you and I are really living in one of the most awesome times ever because now it's become that much easier. Back then you didn't really know who was a, who was a believer. Who, you didn't know. Everybody was kind of living pretty much the same. We're actually in a great place today. It's easier to know where the light is and where the darkness is. As long as we're willing to embrace that and not try to be like what we are not supposed to be like. And pushing God and pushing God and pushing God out. The King James says, who changed the truth of God. Listen to what Barnes Notes says about that. This is a repetition of the declaration in Romans 1.23 in another form. The phrase, the truth of God, is a Hebrew phrase, phrase meaning the true God. In such a case when, where two nouns come together, one is employed as an adjective to qualify the other. Most commonly, the latter of two nouns is used as the adjective, but sometimes it is the former, as in this case, God is called the true God in opposition to idols, which are called false gods. There is but one real or true God, and all others are false. So it says in the King James, it changed the truth of God. But according to what Barnes notes here saying, what it really is saying was it changed the true God. It replaced the true God with a false God. What's that false God? Me. I do what's right in my own eyes. I believe whatever I want to believe. I pick and choose from the Word of God. And finally, God says, that's the way you want it. I've watched some of you have seen it on social media. I'm sorry, Facebook is public, whatever. People that used to be parts of this church, some people that have been involved in ministry in this church, and now they don't even believe there's a God. How do you go from ever being an apostolic to the point where now you don't even believe there's a God? How do, you go, how do you go there? I tell you, I just read it to you. I just read to you how you get to the point you could have one time believed in God, but now you don't even believe in God is because you pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed Him out of your mind, out of your life, to the point He finally says, Okay. Solomon said, Rejoice, O young man, in thy youth, and let thy heart cheer thee in the days of thy youth. Walk in the ways of thine heart and in the sight of thine own. Do whatever you want to do. Live however you want to live. Too bad it doesn't stop there. Do whatever's right in your own eyes. You want to do what's right in your eyes? Do what's right in your own eyes. However, know this. For all these things, God will bring thee into judgment. Why is it that God will bring thee in judge, into judgment? Because everything that is of this world passes away. But that which those who do the will of God and God last forever. You know what, you, you know what is an amazing thing about God? Is, you know, I, I, I don't... Um, how many of you have never heard me whistle? You've you never heard me whistle. A couple of you. Would you like for me to whistle so that you can know I can whistle? Nope. I can whistle. 
I'm actually a decent whistler. I'm known around this building. You hear me coming a lot of times before you see me. But if you don't believe I whistle, can whistle, and you need to hear me right now to believe it, that's on you. Because the moment you try to do something like that to me, my stubbornness kicks in. You know what's a really cool thing about God? He is not provoked to prove He's God. How in the world God hadn't already zapped this world to pieces is mind-boggling. When the creature, wasn't it Romans talks about worshiping the creature? I know we all, well, we talk about, well, how, I don't know how anybody could ever be a tree hugger or worship. I don't think that's really what it's really talking about. It's worshiping the creature. I am a creature created by God. And if I am not careful, I can worship the creature more than I worship the creator. Because when I put myself, my wishes, my desires, my plans, my dreams, my ambitions, my goals above God's will for my life, I'm now worshiping the creature more than I'm worshiping the creator. Solomon says, go ahead, man, do whatever you want to do. Live however you want to live. Just know one thing. As much as God may, according to Romans, turn you over to do whatever you want to do, live however you want to live, not bother you anymore, that's not the end of the story. Because one day, he's finally going to make it really clear who's God and who's not. He may leave room for questioning in some people's minds right now, but there's coming a day that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Go ahead, Eve, eat of this tree because the Lord God knows that the day you eat of it, you'll be like Him. He's just done, he's, he's just, this is stuff He's trying to keep you from that you have a... What is there God's trying to keep us from that we're missing out on? Last passage, 2 Peter 1, 2. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. According as His divine power hath given unto us all things... The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, it's all temporal. It all passes away. But He has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of Him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through the lust. I'm missing out because I don't eat of the tree of the knowledge. I'm missing out. What am I, what am I missing out on? It's so amazing. The enemy tries to tell saints that you're living a life of bondage. And so he offers you freedom from the Word of God. But have you ever noticed that everything the enemy offers you as freedom ends in bondage. We're, we're in bondage because we live the way we... We're in bondage because we try to live pure and holy and... Ple- we're, we're the ones that are in bondage. Hmm. But the people out there that are living free... They're the ones that have it made, as some of them are trying to figure out somehow how in the world are they going to find some money this evening to come up with enough money to be able to get another fix that they have to have because they're free. The enemy promises freedom and leads us bondage. God invites us to servitude that really leads to freedom. 
I don't know, freedom. I, yeah, it's the same freedom you and I have this evening to all the drivers when you pull out on Ritchie Highway. You have the freedom to drive within the speed limit. Whether I agree with it or not, it's there for my benefit and safety. I'm not bound by, that's my protection. This is at least one family, up oh, two families. I think I saw a rafter maybe up in the booth. There's at least two families. Anybody else come from, I know Murphy's and Rat. Anybody else come from across the bridge or have to go across the bridge tonight? The Bay Bridge. Anybody would love, I'm probably going to get a hand on this, and we need to pray for you. I'm just going to tell you, but go ahead and be honest anyway. Anybody here tonight, you would love to drive across the Bay Bridge without guardrails. Really? I honestly, I thought I would get at least one, one of you crazy people. I am surprised. Is there anybody, I got a question, I'm almost done, I'm almost done. Is there anyone that's ever driven across the Bray Bridge and you've looked at them guardrails on each side of that road and thought, I cannot believe somebody put these, this is so, I am so confined and restricted, I just can't. Absolutely not. Because there's, there's actually freedom in those guardrails. Because if you go outside of those guardrails at the top of the bridge, it ain't no more freedom you done. And yet, time and time again, people fall to the temptation from the enemy that says, freedom. You can, you can run your own life. You can make your own choices. You can be... Whatever you want to be, do whatever you want to do. And especially for us here tonight, because we live in the land of the free. Yeah, we live in the land of the free. Go buy some lumber this weekend and go put an addition on your house. Find out how free the land we live in is. Skip the permit process. Let's see how free we are. All that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, and it passes away. I, 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 I was in a conversation today, and I've been in a couple other conversations this week, where I honestly, sometimes I get frustrated because I, I want to give this like concrete answer. But I got to tell you and hear me, hear me deacons and those of you that are directly involved in giving guidance and counsel and whatever to people. If there's not a concrete answer in the word of God, you don't have the right to give a concrete answer. And we have a tendency to give concrete answers that are based on our experiences and our opinions and our The plan of salvation is pretty clear. Except the man be born of water and of spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The gospel is the death, the burial, and the resurrection. Oh, that, that, there's no... But there's a bunch of other things that aren't so clear. That you've got to take the principles of the Word of God and apply them. I'll give you a perfect... I've, I've hit this one before. I'm going to hit it again tonight. As pastor, there ain't no set process on what you do to find a mate, find a spouse, get married. There's no set process on that. There's no set way. And what we have a tendency to do in a lot of different ways, relationships, ministry, etc. We have a tendency to take our experiences and make them the expectation of how everything's supposed to be done. And, and, and so we, we, we have to be mindful 
where the Word speaks clearly, it's clear. But where I have to learn to take some principles and apply them. You, 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 when it comes, this is a frustrating thing, but you may not apply the principle the exact way I apply the principle. But if you're applying the principle in a way that is ultimately in alignment with the Word of God, But, but, but we are living in a day and time in which the enemy is trying so hard to make it all about just your way, my way. This is the way I, this, no, no. No, if I elevate myself to become like God, I have reached a very dangerous place. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my ways. See if there be any wicked way. I, I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's just seriously the aging process or other things. But I, I apparently can't seem pretty much to send a text or an email or post something on Realm without some kind of grammatical error. And I can't tell you how many times I sit there and reread it, edit a few things, reread it, only... For my wife to say, um, you got a mistake? No, I don't. And she's so kind. You know what she told me the other day? She said, most of the time, I just go on there and edit it. I don't even tell you. Isn't that, that is so sweet. Really, it is. But it's frustrating that I'm trying. And I'm trying more than ever. Used to, I'd didn't do that that way. But somehow, I'm just not seeing it. Be careful when you decide all you're going to rely on is what you see how you see it. Because you might be seeing incorrectly. Father, I trust, hope, and pray that over the course of the last several weeks that I have ministered on these verses, that I have communicated what you would have me to communicate and shared what you would have me share. And I pray tonight, God, that you would help every one of us. Because, Lord, it doesn't matter how long we've been around. It doesn't matter how long it's been since we were born again. We have not reached a point that we are exempt from struggling with the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. I pray tonight, God, if there's any of us that are a ways down that path, it's gone beyond just the lust of our flesh and it's even gone beyond things that are now the lust of our eyes, but we are reaching the point where we're giving in to the temptation of becoming like you, of making ourselves equal with you, presuming to have the right to determine what's right and wrong, what's needful, what's not needful. By your grace, help us. By your grace and your mercy, God, don't let us reach the place that Paul talked about where you just turn us over, give us up to do those things we desire without any restrictions, without any guilt or condemnation. By your grace, God, before it's too late for any of us, I pray that you would intervene and help us. That we would find a place of repentance, a place of renewing, 
a place, God, of going back to where we are pursuing being fully submitted and committed to you, your will, your way. By your grace tonight, I pray, God, that any blindness of the enemy that's warring against our minds, any deceptions of the enemy that we are giving in to believing, help us, God, to remember that you've given us all things, all things that pertain to life and godliness. You've given us exceeding great and precious promises. You're not trying to keep any good thing from us, God, but you're trying to give us everything that is good for us. Open our eyes, renew our minds and our spirits. Renew our sensitivity and our discernment to you, Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for being here this evening. I hope to see you on Sunday in Jesus' name.